knowing that it's this, this moment of hope and change that everybody's been longing for. Now attend UPS Vice President Houston Mills helping transport precious cargo tonight as hundreds of facilities across our country, including right here in Utah, they prepare for the first shipments of the COVID-19 vaccine. And frontline workers rejoice as the reality of being vaccinated against this killer virus draws closer. Plus, two Wasatch County High School students, they are facing felony charges after outlining a possible school threat to another student. Live from Utah's first TV station, ABC4 News at 10 starts now. The American public can be really assured of a high quality and effective vaccine. And good evening. It is great to have you with us on this Sunday night. A lot of folks calling what's going to happen tomorrow a very hopeful event. History in the making even. Today, millions of doses of Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine taking flight, heading to hundreds of destinations across the U.S. Here's what we know. 2.9 million doses will be sent to 636 locations across all 50 states and U.S. territories, including right here in Utah. They're expected to begin arriving tomorrow. Healthcare workers, seniors and first responders, they will be the first to be vaccinated. This comes as workers carefully pack those coolers with dry ice into refrigerated carts. It's inside Pfizer's Michigan facility you're looking at there. This past week, the deadliest so far in our country with nearly 100 Americans lost to the virus every single hour. And so closer to home, we're hearing from a frontline worker tonight, a nurse face to face with COVID patients every single day. He told us why. Well, quite frankly, he is excited for the vaccine. Jordan Burroughs joining us live. You talk to this man, Jordan, what do you have to say? Yeah, Nick, uh, that ER nurse with Intermountain Healthcare, who I spoke with, uh, absolutely thrilled. I'm smiling because he was smiling about being able to have access to the COVID-19 vaccine tomorrow. I'm live at Intermountain Healthcare, which is one of the first hospital chains that will receive this COVID-19 vaccine tomorrow. Josh Lane, the name of that ER nurse, just says this couldn't come soon enough. It never stops. It never slows down. The waves of COVID patients never seem to stop. But nurses like Josh Lane keep coming to work, risking their lives to save victims of the pandemic. It gives us an extra level of protection. Medical professionals clad in PPE have been as protected as anyone on the front lines of the pandemic from drive through testing sites to emergency care room. It's why Josh Lane, an ER doc at Intermount Healthcare, says the vaccine, which healthcare workers, as we previously reported, will be among the first to receive, is a real sign of hope. It's like relaxing to know that we will have that extra level or armor, as you call it, that we can show up, we can still do our jobs, we can take the very best care of patients. Patients continually in and out, symptomatic, asymptomatic, on ventilators, off ventilators. Lane says he and his fellow nurses are scared to pass on COVID-19 to other people if they are asymptomatic. Even worse, he says, mending his sick co-workers. I can't imagine taking care of one of my own co-workers. And he cannot imagine a future without the COVID-19 vaccine. Still, he says it will be critical to keep protecting our faces and our families. And as always, by continuing to wear masks, limit gatherings, and work together to end this pandemic. It's not going to be a quick fix. You know, we're excited that we are going to be able to get it, but it's still going to take time for everybody in the community to receive it. Lane says, as a reminder for those people at home that aren't really sure what works on the front lines for those health care workers in and out of the hospitals every day, he says it takes a lot of courage for those health line, excuse me, for those health workers and frontline workers to be able to go to the hospital face to face with COVID-19 every day. Of course, ABC4, we will be bringing you updates tomorrow as the COVID-19 vaccine it seems to finally roll out. Reporting live in Murray, Jordan Burroughs, ABC4 News. Okay, Jordan, thank you. Let's talk about where Utah stands now. As we fight COVID-19, the health department announcing today that case counts, they are back on track after some maintenance issues skewed some case counts over the last couple of days. Today, they're reporting 2,083 new cases of COVID, bringing our total case count now to 233,904. Currently, 548 people are hospitalized across our state with complications from that virus. Meantime, 17 more people have died from COVID-19. That brings our death toll now to 1,055. 11 of today's deaths were men, six were women. Now there were six deaths from Salt Lake County, four in Utah County, three in Weber County, and two in Washington County. Meantime, there was one death each in both Iron and Morgan counties. 
14 of the 17 were hospitalized or in a long-term care facility at the time of their deaths. The other three were not. And this is our seven day averages do begin a slight decline. Right now our seven day average sits at 2,633 cases per day. Our positive test average sitting at 24.6%. That means roughly one in four tests comes back with a positive result for COVID. Meteorologist Jeff James joins us now. Jeff, how are we doing tonight? We know that uh, there might be some snow tomorrow morning. Yeah, things are starting to gel here on the weather maps. Uh, we're anticipating what's really a low grade storm, but it's enough. Well, the weather service is convinced enough that we have a weather advisory out. So we're not talking about a winter storm warning where it's just brutal and you can't travel with snow flying sideways. But certainly a few inches are in order for the Wasatch Front and points beyond. And at the moment, we're still waiting for the major forcing mechanism to get this going. It's a cold front that's uh, lined up between Elko and Wendover for the most part. And we look at a live, well, web snapshot anyway from Elko and you can see the snow streaks. Uh, not a real heavy situation at this moment, but again, it'll go on for a little while. We got uh, from tonight through tomorrow morning, uh, right through the day, and here we go through the overnight hours, increasing light snows. Again, Nick, not a big deal by tomorrow morning, but by mid morning or so, there will be some periods where the snow will become a bit more moderate. So travel advisory and do. Back okay, to in December, here we are in the winter time. Thank you, Jeff. New at 10, two Wasatch High School students are facing terrorism charges after being taken into custody on Saturday. Police say the students at Heber's Wasatch High were arrested after telling a fellow student about a possible threat on Friday. Students currently being held at a juvenile detention center. They are likely going to be charged with threats of terrorism, a second degree felony, and threats against a school, a misdemeanor. Again, charges haven't been filed, but that's what we're being told by authorities. The investigation though is ongoing. Now, let's just give you a little context. Back in February of 2018, two students from Wasatch High School were charged with similar crimes after making threats on social media. And new tonight, a man is dead after being shot and killed by police this morning. It happened in Farmington about 2 a.m. this morning after officers say he approached them with a weapon. Now we're told police were conducting inventory of a stolen vehicle at the time when a car crashed into a Farmington police patrol car. The driver then quote aggressively engaged both Farmington officers and Utah Highway Patrol troopers. That man was shot after police say he advanced towards them, refusing to respond to verbal commands. The man later died in the hospital room from injuries. And a Utah woman facing second degree murder charges following the death of a Michigan State trooper last summer. Now, police say Thomasina Jones. She was ordered to stand trial after a number of witnesses testified last week that her blood alcohol level was very high, leading to a crash that killed trooper Caleb Starr back on July 10th. Documents say Jones was driving 100 miles per hour at the time when she smashed into Trooper Star's patrol car, killing him. We're moving on now to a live look from Washington, D.C. Time is running out for President Trump and his fight to overturn the election. He and his team have lost nearly 50 lawsuits seeking to change the election's outcome. The Electoral College will cast their votes tomorrow. It's the next step in making President-elect Joe Biden's victory official. It will then move on to Congress, where the votes will be counted and announced in a joint session on January 9th. Well, unrest from, well, clashes between Trump and anti-Trump supporters. This was happening last night in our nation's capital, and it got pretty violent. Four people in critical condition after being stabbed last night. Demonstrations during the day peaceful, but this is how it evolved. Washington, D.C. police reported mostly peaceful rallies throughout the day from Trump, pro uh, from Trump protesters and then pro-president demonstrators as well. But again, by nightfall, things turned violent. Police say 23 people arrested and six officers assaulted. Well, coming up, we take a look back at all the must-have toys from seasons past. Craig Worth breaks it all down for us, and yeah, kids of all ages, definitely worth watching. And a live look outside. No snow at the moment, but that will be changing at the bus stop tomorrow morning for your kids. We'll let you know how many inches of snow we get coming up.
Welcome back. As you can imagine, this is the time of, well, the biggest toy sales of the year. Every year there's the new must-have. In my day, I guess it was Tickle Me Elmo or Tamagotchi, but Craig Worth, well, he knows a lot about a lot of things, going back a little bit further. He had some must-have toys of years past. We're talking about Slinkies, Tonka Trucks, even Silly Putty. Here's Craig Worth taking us back tonight with a look at the must-have toys from decades past. As always, it's worth watching. Gives a big lift when wrapped as a gift, a very likable toy. It's of course, there were just some standard toys. Toy. It's slinky, it's slinky, for fun it's a wonderful toy. It's slinky, it's slinky, it's fun for a girl and a boy. Yep, the gotta haves, like Silly Putty. All other toys were divided into two categories. Those that parents feared would blow up your house. Brand new chemistry, brand new packages. There's fun in Gilbert Chemistry for 1963. And those that parents feared, that could put an eye out. Zooming through space just like Superman does in his adventures. Now you'll want to be one of the first to have your own flying Superman. Oh, I was big time into Tonka trucks. They're made of steel that's rugged and painted brightly too. And every single one looks real with lots of things to do. There are Tonka toys to push and drive and Tonka toys that dig. To make your playtime come alive, here's a terrific rig. Oh, of course, everyone had a favorite toy. Every morning, I got to truck in a frozen can of Minute Maid orange juice from the freezer to the kitchen. I hit a lot of door jams along the way. You never part with your favorite toy. I did put a Channel 4 sticker on it 50 years ago when I was first hired here. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man from head to toe, on the land, on the sea, in the air. Other toys, oh, lots of them. Heroes were big in the 50s and 60s. A new Major League record, 61 home runs by Roger Maris. Hi, kids. That sure was a day for me. Part of the thrill of baseball. The kind of real excitement I've put into my great new game by Pressman, Action Baseball. Here it comes. A hot single to right. All baseball stuff was big, and you had to put your name on everything you owned. Remember, yes, when phone numbers were cool, and they started with letters. Here he comes, here he comes, greatest toy you've ever seen, and his name is Mr. Machine. You created things for hours. Etch-a-Sketch draws and writes like magic. Turn the knobs and the lines go up and down and all around. Well, the knobs broke after 50 years, I suppose. But all those hours spent on an Etch-a-Sketch back then did pay off. You never forget. Not bad. Yep, you can go back to your childhood with your toys in memories. Well, what about two of the biggest toys? I'm speaking about Barbie dolls and Lionel trains. Well, let's just do full stories on them sometime in the next couple of months. You're the boss on land, sea, and in the air when you own Lionel trains. Now, Craig, well, he says the word swell, so we're going to say this. Here's some swell facts. They made 15 million Tonka dump trucks. But Craig asserts his is by far the best, hands down. Silly Putty, by the way, invented in 1943, not marketed until 1950. Over 300 million Slinkies have been sold and 100 million Etch-a-Sketches. Certainly a lot of those timeless Christmas gifts. And it was, Jeff, the, you know, it was the steel Slinkies, too. And now this seems like they're all plastic. What's the deal here? Come on. Come on. They those don't make the them like they used to, right? More weight behind it could go to all the way down the steps. Anyway. Are we going to have a white Christmas? We are. I'll just get to yeah. it. Yeah, um, I, it's looking good. You know, about every four, three and a half to four days, looks like we're ramping up some storm systems. Can't say that any of one of them are going to be real strong, but it's optimistic to say the least since this season has been so dry. Utah State, this is pointed at the uh, Clinical Services Building. If you got good enough res resolution on your screen, you can probably make out some very light snow, but it's the kind of snow that if it went on for three or four hours, you'd amount to about that much. But it is the first in the priming the pump situation. Okay, so this stuff here, really just the primer, the cold front still waiting out back. And when that arrives early morning, mid-morning, 
then we'll start to see some accumulation stack up a little bit. So for today, just kind of hitting the rewind button, we hit 31 degrees. We could have done a lot better, could have done a lot worse, but uh, we wind chills weren't too bad. We were in the low 20s. The thing is, though, they haven't changed much at all, all day and all night. Uh, temperature 28 degrees now, Provo at 30. The morning commute, yes, uh, it's going to be slick. Could be a bit of a rough ride. I'm not going to put anybody in the red, but certainly the yellow for hesitation. Keep it slow. Driving speeds under the posted limits, that is for sure. High pressure moving out. There's that area of blue indicating the snow, and there's that front. Now we have to wait for that to get in here, and as we kind of take you piece by piece tracking this storm, you'll notice by 6 a.m. it's right on top of us. There's sort of a split, Nephi south, a band there, and to the north. So that's why I think their better snow amounts will be sort of on two different corners of the valley, Weber north and then also Provo south. But when you look at the Futurecast snow model, this thing is out to lunch. I think we're going to do a whole lot better Kaysville, Salt Lake than you know, just under a half an inch, probably in that one to three range, leaning around two to three in Salt Lake. Uh, Provo could easily get to three if it sets up right. The bench is certainly two to five. Mountain Valley's three to six. And then in the high mountains, this is a pretty good number, six to 10 for the Cottonwoods in case you haven't gone skiing just yet. And then eight to 16, which I don't think we're gonna see a lot of 16 inch amounts. Best news is if we miss out on this, as I mentioned, here comes another. That one we miss for the most part Tuesday night, but another arrives Thursday into early Friday. Now it is a little warmer. Temperatures will be in the 40s, so it'll be more of a mix. So we can all appreciate that. We don't have to shovel anything in the valleys, but it will stay up in the snow, up in the mountains. So regional forecast temperatures tomorrow, not changeable at all. Really low 30s, much like today, a lot of clouds and a good amount of snow. Now southern Utah and far eastern Utah, not going to see much at all. Maybe a trace of snow, Cedar City and St. George, just clouds with some wind. 48 tomorrow, St. George with some Breezes, I wouldn't call it all that windy, 46, 51, mid 50s. You miss out on that next storm too. It'll be a small package across mostly northern Utah. Wasatch Front, there you have it. Day one, four more days. Thursday, another four days. There are some indications that Sunday could provide some snow late. So hopefully we can keep this trend and just build things up slowly because we are way behind in the snow bucket. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, we could sure use the precipitation for sure. Yeah. So kind of a little bit of a warning from Jeff here about what's to come. And Wes, comments. what do you think folks in Utah are most excited about right now in Just sports world? That sports is actually going on. Exactly. A lot of college football to talk about tonight, too. BYU stays up late, braves the cold. They're rewarded with the victory, and we'll tell you about their possible bowl game matchup. Plus, the Utes won their game yesterday. Today, they find out who they'll play next week, and we'll tell you when we come back with sports.
Time now for ABC4 News Sports with Wesley Ruff. It was cold. It was late, but ultimately it turned into a win. BYU wrapped up its regular season last night with a home victory over San Diego State. Temperatures in the low 20s for the game. Friends and family braved the cold to watch that. About 1,100 fans there. Cougar struck first. Zach Wilson hooks up with Dax Milne for the touchdown at 7-0. The Aztecs scored 14 straight points to take the lead. But BYU came back second quarter. The TD pass from Wilson to Isaac Rex. It was 17-14. The Cougars at the half in the second half. That defense stepped up. They shut out San Diego State after intermission. And Wilson capped off the scoring with his third touchdown pass of the night. This one to Rex again, his second TD reception. BYU won at 28-14 to finish the regular season at 10-1. Overall, the Cougars were pleased with this season, which wrapped up with the first ever home football game in December. It was cold. It was my coldest game I've ever been a part of. Uh, I think the coldest game I've been a part of besides the Idaho Potato Bowl was like 60-something. So it was for sure a cold game. We just knew that it, the more possessions that we would get, uh, that we'd be okay. So when we had those possessions, just to, uh, I guess, treasure them and be able to continue just to roll that we know that we can do. I'm super proud of the whole defense. I think everyone was just rallying and doing their job. And, you know, sometimes things weren't going our way, but... We were bending, but we didn't break, and everyone showed effort. All the other players on defense really stepped up in crucial moments, and I think that was the, the difference in the game. Well, I'm just glad our guys were able to pull it out and, and never gave up. I mean, it, it, was, it looked really tough at the beginning, you know, but these guys have shown that they'll keep fighting. Looking forward to you know, our next opportunity. We'll see when we play again. Hopefully we can, you know, keep playing football. Well, it looks like Coach Sataki may get his wish. Word has leaked out tonight that BYU might be playing in the Boca Raton Bowl where they will take on Central Florida. That game would take place on Tuesday, December 22nd at 5.30 Mountain Time. BYU 10-1, UCF with a 6-3 record. The official announcement could come as early as tomorrow. And BYU's 14-point win did not help the Cougars move up in the latest AP Top 25 poll that came out today. The Cougars stayed at number 14. Top five teams all stayed the same. Alabama is still number one. Coastal Carolina number nine. USC from the Pac-12 is at 13. And BYU holding steady at number 14. Utah coming off its second straight win. They are 2-2 two and two now. They found out today that they'll be playing in their Pac-12 season finale. The crossover games announced today and BYU or Utah will take on Washington State. That game taking place this Saturday, 11.30 a.m. kickoff. And now if the Utes win that game, there's a chance they could go to a bowl game. But there's also a chance that they could vote not to play the bowl game like Boston College did. The honest truth is, and I, and I don't think that anyone could criticize teams for saying this, is we're all pretty burnt out. Uh, you saw what Boston College did, you know, opting out of their bowl game. And I don't blame them at all because the whole team, we're pretty burnt out just with the emotional uh, drag of the season. So to have one, one game is not fun, but at the same time, we're, we're ready to finish strong. We want to finish with a winning record, you know, going into next year. In the NFL today, some local players had some good moments. Former BYU quarterback Taysom Hill getting his start. A quarterback again for the New Orleans Saints with the touchdown pass here. Then he threw another touchdown pass late in the game. That got the Saints close, but they lost the game to the Eagles. Former University of Utah receiver Tim Patrick, number 81 in white, catches the touchdown pass here for the Broncos. Then breaks out into a nice little dance move. Ooh, shake it, but don't break it. Patrick having a good year for Denver. KC's Patrick Mahomes has this pass tipped, and then it's picked off by another former Ute, Eric Rowe, who added a nice little return at the end of that interception. But the best interception came from this guy, former Weaver State star Taron Johnson, who picks off Ben Roethlisberger, takes it back 50 yards to the house for a pick six, his second career interception, his first career touchdown. Congratulations to him. And on the links, the final round of the QBE shootout in Florida. Tony Finau playing with Cameron Champ in the two-man team format. This is Champ, just hammers this birdie putt in at ramming speed. Finau and Champ ended up the three-day event at 26 under par. That was good for a tie for fifth, which is good. But there were only 12 teams involved. The winners, Matt Kuchar and Harris English, they finished at 37 under par, rolled to a nine-shot victory over Sabatini and Tway. And so much happened this past week. Nick, the Utes, the Cougars, both win. Crazy stuff going on up in Logan. The Jazz Open preseason. We're going to just discuss all of those things coming up at 10:35 on Real Sports Live. Join me and Danny Green right after the news. Well, talking about the Jazz, Wes, are there a few takeaways? We obviously just finished the previous season. Boyan but Bogdanovich is back. He's back, that's, right? That's the best part. That's yeah. what I was going to say. A lot of yeah. folks supposed to be excited about. Yeah. Okay, and we'll be back right after this break.
Welcome back. Obviously, the immune system top of mind for the entire year of 2020. It's obviously your immune system supposed to protect you against disease. But what happens when that system isn't working right? In tonight's sponsored Utah Success Stories, here's Doug Jessup now to explain. 90% of the time, I felt like a hypochondriac, like it was all in my head that I was causing all of this. Imagine being sick, but not being able to find out what was wrong. Nikki Davis knows the feeling. Migraine, brain fog, um, I could not lose weight no matter what I had done. I was extremely tired. I had high anxiety all of the time. Nikki was finally diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. According to Rand.org, 42% of all Americans are now living with multiple chronic conditions. Dr. Josh Redd from Red River Health and Wellness explains. For example, if you have Hashimoto's, which is the number one cause of low thyroid, that's where your immune system attacks the thyroid. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, your immune system is turning on your own body's tissue and attacking the joints. Or you could have your immune system attacking the intestinal tract or the brain. A lot of our autoimmune patients don't just have one autoimmune condition. They have multiple autoimmune conditions, and some of them don't even know it. According to Dr. Red, precise testing and analysis are making a difference. This isn't based off of guesswork. It's not based off of theories. Like we can do the proper blood tests and the proper uh, medical testing to identify exactly what these patients' triggers are. And that could be blood sugar imbalances, cortisol defects, hormonal imbalances, intestinal issues, neurological problems. I mean, the list goes on. What causes these attacks? There's environmental and lifestyle things that will trigger an autoimmune patient to flare up too. And so these patients are eating things that are like rat poison for them, and they don't even have an idea. <laughs> How's Nikki doing? I lost almost 50 pounds just of inflammation, just of years of not taking care of my body, just of um, buildup of all of these things, all of the stress that I had had from so many years. With another Utah success story, I'm Doug Jessup, ABC4 News. So many factors that come together when it comes to our health. And if you want to see more Utah success stories, you want to nominate a company, Obviously, Doug pays attention. You can go to abc4.com slash success. And obviously, Jeff, it's winter time. It's what, snow tire time? It is. It is, Come yeah. tomorrow. I think we, <laughs> I'm glad I got those snow tires on just in time, literally, like two weeks ago. Uh, we're going to have some slicking conditions out there on the roadways and the turnoffs. And, boy, the neighborhoods are going to get slick. Temperatures, 30s. Look for a few inches in Salt Lake. Okay, a few inches in Salt Lake. Snow coming tomorrow morning. Real Sports Live coming up next. <laughs>